December 12th, 1934. A man shows up at the home of another man that he knows. Goes out of the backyard, finds that man dead in a pond in his backyard. Hey guys, Steve the Amateur Historian. And this is Historic Murders of Portland. I shouldn't chuckle at the concept of murder. That was just such a <laughs> scatterbrained introduction. Today I am in the Irvington neighborhood, a beautiful area. This is a little bit more commercial right here, but when you get to the residential tracts, I don't think that's the right term to use, but there's a lot of beautiful homes out here. Um, and even, you know, a lot of these homes are extremely old too. So back in the day, this was still a gorgeous neighborhood. And in this neighborhood lived 70-year-old seeming socialite, Simon Mish, who I am just a couple blocks from his home, which even if you look up records of historic places here and there, um, his home is known as the Simon Mish home, so I'm assuming he was either the most prominent person to live there or he was the first person to live there, I don't know, but he was known for uh, throwing fairly lively, lavish parties. He was, uh, seems like even in his retirement years, he was a fairly well-to-do gentleman and I mean, unfortunately, such made him an easy target for crime. He had money expensive possessions, and he was an older gentleman. And despite his discovery being on December 12th, 1934, he was discovered by his gardener. It was abundantly clear that Simon Mish had actually died sometime, presumably the night before, and whoever killed him left him in his backyard. The killing didn't occur in his backyard, but Mish's home had a, it's described as a pond, so it may have just been kind of little, you know, dip in the ground where you have your own private, private little pond, or maybe it was actually like, you know, a circular structure that was actually like man-made. Uh, but whatever the case, um, after his passing, Mish was pretty much tossed into this pool and it's believed he was still alive actually when he was thrown into this pool and strangely sinister enough he had a poodle and that poodle was also found in the pond with him dead um, you know I know poodles you know any dog can be aggressive when they need to be but it seems interesting to think of a poodle and to think of a poodle as maybe an attack dog or a poodle really defending their owner. I can only assume that this individual attacked Simon Mish and his poodle came to his defense and in that vein, the individual ended up killing off the poodle too. Why he would put both of them in a pond in the backyard, uh, I don't know. Maybe he was in a rush, maybe he was desperate, maybe he wasn't a very skilled criminal and only thought things through to the point of the kill or the crime, whatever his initial intent was. I mean, it seems pretty clear the objective was robbery, a robbery gone wrong when we consider how well-to-do Simon Mish was. I don't know. I don't know why, why his poodle was also killed. Do you know how nice and quiet it is? It's so beautiful and peaceful and unassuming. And it was probably a lot like this, even more so, back in the 30s when there was a smaller population. Hardly seems to be the type of area where you'd think a gruesome crime like this would take place, but 
I'm walking along Thompson Street and about to turn north here onto Northeast 10th Avenue. And this is the stretch that Simon Mish lived along. And again, as I always say, I hate uh, filming private residences, so I'm gonna not be here for too long, but it was the fifth house, sixth house up from this intersection back here. So one, two, three, four, it's just the other side of this red house right here. It's, you can kind of see it through the foliage. This is the Simon Mish house right here. Now, police theorize that Simon Mish was in his home here that night, uh, night of December 11th, and he was playing cards, it seems. Uh, there was cards laid out on a card table, and they think that, apparently people who knew Simon Mish said he liked to play his music really loud while he sat home and played cards and just had a you know jolly old time living his life, and he... Um, the person who broke in likely access through the back door of this home and he was drowned out by the music Mish was playing which you know made it seem pretty clear that this was somebody who probably knew him um, that they would know have a general idea of what he was doing on this night um, he snuck in through the back door and struck Simon Mish uh, in the head um, frac caused a fracture in his head, probably rendered him unconscious before he was then ultimately thrown in the pond in the back backyard. So his assailant likely thought he died from that and probably was just disposing of the body. But uh, it was believed that he was, Mish, was still alive after getting that blow to the head. And they thought the blow to the head was likely done with a decanter, which are like those kind of big glass bottles that you put, you know, whiskey and who knows what else into. And it's just, it's so quiet here. You'd never think something like that would happen, but one of the benefits is the person who attacked him, who it, clearly it was robbery. Simon Mish had a $800 ring that he wore on his finger that was missing. And it, there was actually a pile of cash discovered like in the front doorway, like whoever did this grabbed a bunch of cash and just ran. And when they dropped cash, they just were like, screw it, I don't have time. So a bunch of cash was found like in the doorway of Mish's home uh, in the aftermath. But the attacker um, appeared to have cut himself while gaining entry to the home and you know it was pretty simple he left fingerprints all over the place and that's how the police were able to uh, pretty much target a particular individual in this case a guy by the name of Joseph Osborne and it was deemed this crime likely happened between 11 p.m. at midnight, December 11th, 1934. And a little interesting thing happened uh, within a half hour to an hour after this crime had happened, and it was in regards to this Joseph Osborne, just a little ways up the road. Around 12.30 a.m., so technically the following day after Simon Mish was killed, Osborne was seen at a restaurant along Union Avenue, which this is Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard now, but this was Union Avenue, and I'm only like three or four blocks from where the Mish home uh, was located. Um, and he was seen at a restaurant here, reportedly injured, and he had blood on him. Suspicious. And he would tell people, because of course, when you've got blood all over you and a guy near you that you knew turns up dead, you always have to have a convenient story in place. And he just claimed that some guys attacked him, he had to fight him off, and he got away. That was his story. And Osborne would ultimately be apprehended on the 14th. So, just a little more than two days after the assault, or murder, uh, right here in this home. And he actually admitted to coming to that home uh, and visiting Mish on the night of the killings claimed that they'd 
had a few drinks, talked a little bit, uh, which had to make officers' ears perk on end. There's already witnesses who have seen him uh, with, you know, blood on him. And even when officers obtained him on the 14th, they noticed these injuries, like he'd been fighting with someone. Uh, the presumption could be reached beyond uh, Osborne's tale of being attacked by random assailants. Uh, was that he tried to attack Simon Mish. Simon Mish fought back and the younger Osborne ultimately prevailed in the fight. So this guy was really not doing himself any favors. But this is only the beginning of problems for Joseph Osborne. He already has this questionable story where he's like, yeah, I went and visited Mish that night, but I would never kill him, which was you know, you could argue, is that just a cover story for when they find uh, any prints or any other evidence that this guy has had been in the home? He could just say, oh, well, I visited him that night, but I don't know who killed him. But there's things go deeper because Joseph Osborne wasn't just some random uh, guy that happened to know the murder victim. He wasn't just some deadbeat wandering around Irvington killing time looking for trouble. I mean, he was looking for trouble, but he was actually a special, he was described as a special officer for the Portland police, which makes me almost think like he was more or less a glorified security guy, but he was clearly not of the mental state to handle this job. He was clearly very unqualified for it. And as it came out that he might potentially be involved in the killing, of a man that he knew in the Irvington neighborhood, because this is the area that as a special officer, Osborne worked. And he was a menace. He terrorized this quiet community. He would, uh, people reported he would try to run over their pets. Uh, he, apparently, he apparently had a visceral hatred of animals. Um, yeah, he wreaked havoc around here, but beyond, as a special officer beyond Osborne's penchant for wanting to kill people's pets. He also was reported to have broken in to like people's cars along the street and tried to steal stuff from their cars. So he'd already been reported as burglarizing people's property. And when you think Simon Mish's murder was obviously the result, it seems, of a robbery gone bad, gone wrong, now you have a security guy who has a shaky story about seeing him that night and also has a history while working for the police, it seems, of burglarizing people's properties. It actually came out, I don't know if he was ever officially identified as such, but there was a guy that wandered this area, Irvington, and he was known as the Kissing Burglar. And he roamed around this area, you know, around this time, around the time that Joseph Osborne is committing all sorts of stuff. And essentially this guy would just, you know, walk up to random women, random unassuming women, women who were out by themselves, um, victims of opportunity. And he would run up and just kiss them and like assault them. And it's interesting, the police were like looking for this guy and couldn't figure out who it was. And now people are starting to wonder, well, is it this guy that was hired by the police that's been doing this crap all along? Are they, you know, trying to investigate what's going on? And what they should be doing is investigating a guy who's sort of one of their own, sort of. And in the process of being grilled, the police actually asked Osborne, if he was his kissing burglar, and he of course said something that made him look very suspicious, which is he essentially said he had actually seen this guy on his beat prowling around the area, but could never quite catch him, which is a pretty convenient way of saying, hey, uh, it's me, but as long as I say it's somebody else, everyone's going to think it's somebody else. And one thing that Osborne was supposed to do as a special officer is he was supposed to radio in every hour standard well while he was supposedly on his beat during this time he radioed in at about 11:45 if i am accurate
Yes. <laughs> Cut that middle part. Just redo that. Yes. 11.45 p.m. Officially the last time Osborne radioed in. He didn't radio in after that, even though he was apparently still on duty. But what a convenience. Right around the time Simon Mish is murdered, suddenly he has a crime that he's committed. It obviously went horribly wrong because at the end of the day, he probably didn't mean to kill Mish. Or maybe he did. I mean... The two knew each other. If he would have robbed Mish, Mish would have probably been able to identify him later. So maybe he killed him as a witness. You know, no witness. He might get away with it. But either way, he has this crime. He probably didn't know what the hell he was doing. Got scatterbrained afterwards and was so focused on getting rid of the body, evading the crime scene and trying to look like he didn't do anything that he forgot to do one of the most basic things he needed to do to keep from arousing suspicion, which is if you're on the clock as a special officer, you make sure to do everything that that special officer job entails, including remembering to radio in every hour. But conveniently, right around the time, you know, he does it up to the point that Simon Mish is killed and then suddenly doesn't do it anymore. And, you know, while they're tearing his story apart, authorities search his car, they find a bloody flashlight, a bloody like blanket in there the, you know every second this guy's going down and going down a little more and a little more descending into the coolness of the Lloyd Center parking garage helping I don't suffer a fate similar to Simon Mish honestly but uh Put it, uh, to put it rather simplistically, uh, this guy, Joseph Osborne, has buried himself pretty deep. But for everything that I've already discussed, while he's being grilled, he even admits he may as well have just taken the item he used to kill Simon Mish out, slammed it down on the counter and been like, there you go. He actually admits not that he actually did this, but that he might have done this under intoxication. Because the idea is that he went over to Simon Mish's place, they drank together, had a jolly old time, a pre-murder celebration. And uh, he actually admitted that he may or may not have returned to Mish's home after he visited with him. Again, right around the time of his murder. And he may have, under intoxication, broken into and robbed him so the guy is more than willing to admit that he may have robbed him you know because that's a small beef so he pretty much admits he might have done everything except kill the guy apparently somebody else just by chance out there in the world was pissed off at Simon Mish and within probably 10 to 15 minutes of the time that drunken Joseph Osborne, who knows Simon Mission has a history of robbery, goes in and robs him and leaves, and then this guy just shows up and randomly kills him. Apparently for no reason, because if Osborne robbed him, what motive would this person have? I don't know. I guess maybe the idea is two robbers just showed up within minutes of each other. That's what this dumb son of a bitch would have the authorities to believe. So, he goes before a grand jury, understandably. This guy is obviously guilty. And he is found guilty of the crime, March 1935. And he actually tried having it reversed because they couldn't get a unanimous verdict, which obviously there was somebody on that jury that didn't understand the concept of not having reasonable doubt, because how you could have reasonable doubt in this case, you know. The guy practically admitted everything aside from, you know, handing the authorities the murder weapon, which I don't believe was ever found. They kind of maintained it was probably a alcoholic decanter of some kind. They actually found something similar to that among Joseph Osborne's possessions. Um, I thought maybe that was the murder weapon, but they checked it. It was deemed to actually not be the murder weapon. But while this bottle decanter type thing, whatever exactly it was that they found amongst Joseph Osborne's possessions. If that wasn't the murder weapon, 
while they found a bloody flashlight and bloody garments in his car, while he was preparing to make his plea in this case, authorities searched his home and they discovered a hatchet, which is a perfect weapon for cracking someone's skull, like what happened to uh, Simon Mish. They found a hatchet in his home with human blood on it. Not just blood, it was stated specifically human blood. And it wasn't able to find in the old newspapers anything that discussed that discovery beyond just the fact that that item had been discovered, but it seems likely, unless he killed somebody else, that that may have very well been the weapon he brought with him to kill Simon Mish, which shows premeditation in his case. Um, you know, there was no way this guy was going to get off. It seems like he was going in there to rob the place, but he was prepared to kill if he had to, and maybe he had every intention of killing Simon Mish. He may have, may have been jealous. He obviously had a few screws loose. He may have figured, this guy's 70 years old, which is really old. 70 was like, you know, 90 back in the 30s. He may have figured, this guy's old, he's loaded, he's going to die soon. Why shouldn't I just, you know, he's lived a full life. Why don't I just take advantage of his uh, his largesse, I believe is the term, and just uh, steal some of his stuff and put him out of his misery. That may have been his thought process. Who's to say? So anyway, it's nice and cool in here. Uh, that is the story of the murder, 1934 murder, of 70-year-old Irvington Portland socialite Simon Mish murdered in his home, blood splattered on the walls while he was assumingly playing solitaire in his living room, tossed to drown, essentially, in his own backyard pond. So, yay, what an uplifting story. And anyway, before I wander through the mall or get accosted for walking around with a camera, let me just say thank you again for watching. As always, remember to like, comment, be nice about it, share, subscribe, and uh, hit my Patreon if you want to help me out that way. And uh, all that said, till next time, guys, this is Steve, the Amateur Historian, and I'm going to do a little mall walking.